lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Since 1858, the ANS has supported research and education in numismatics and the history of money. With a collection of over 800,000 objects, an extensive library, a dynamic publishing arm, and ever-improving online research resources, we have become one of the largest numismatic institutions in the world. If you wish to support the ANS and the work we do, you can join as a member and become a part of this historic community. Go to numismatics.org membership to see options and prices. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone today to the American Numismatic Society Money Talks for September 12th. And uh, I was asked to give a program on something Byzantine or medieval. And uh, one of the little areas of interest that I have had for quite a few years is on the lightweight solidi. And uh, indeed, I have found these perplexing. Uh, as have evidently almost all serious students of numismatics who have approached Here. this peculiar Byzantine series. Now, I'm afraid I won't be able to provide enlightenment today for those of you who may think that there is an answer to what's going on with these things. Uh, but I'll try to cover the series a little bit and try to indicate uh, some of why this is perplexing and why it seems very much of interest. And we know that uh, the Emperor Justinian I, Justinian the Great, who ruled from 527 to 565, was one of the great movers and shakers of history. Uh, he brought about a major change in the Roman gold coinage in the year 538. Uh, and we know it was at this time that he introduced an entirely new portraiture system on his copper coinage on the uh, 40 Numi Follies as they're called. But he also made, about the same time, we suppose, uh, a drastic change in the gold coinage, in its appearance, that is. Uh, for nearly 200 years, the principal type on the obverse of Roman gold had been uh, a three-quarter portrait of the emperor with a shield on his shoulder, cuirassed, wearing a helmet, and holding a spear over his shoulder. But along with the change to the copper coinage, which went from a profile to the facing bust, Justinian introduced a facing bust of the emperor holding not a spear, but a globus cruciger in his right hand. Now this interesting change coincided with exactly when the various changes occur. And there were a series of additional changes uh, involving the weights of the copper coins uh, in the years following. Now the copper coinage was fiduciary and it was largely experimental in many cases, although issued in huge volumes. The gold coinage, on the other hand, was extremely consistent, always of uh, standard weight, always of gold as pure as could be manufactured at the time period. And uh, it was a very strange aberration of the Byzantine late Roman state that a series of coins occurred that did not bear the full normal weight, which we believe uh, had a theoretical the uh, weight of 4.55 grams. Now, along with these two portrait gold solidi of Justinian the Great, I've included a portrait of him. I rather like this of him as an older man, as he might have been at the time of the change of the gold coin. But this actually is a portrait that could reflect somewhat more the appearance of his contemporary, the Ostrogothic King Theodoric because this appears in the, uh, the chapel of the palace of Theodoric in Ravenna, which became the, the church Santa Polinari Nuovo, as it's known since then, uh, well, since a little bit later. Uh, and the portrait in there, which is identified as being of Justinian, uh, actually might have been a modified portrait of uh, Theodoric the Ostrogoth. Our friends at CNG, Classical Numismatic Group, whenever they uh, list in their catalogs one of the peculiar lightweight series of Byzantine gold solidi, put in this text. One of the most intractable problems in Byzantine numismatics is proven to be the lightweight solidi, and so on. The initial theory that they're produced for trade beyond the borders of the empire uh, is simply an historical accident. 
based on the first tour. So this is something that was well addressed by Howard Adelson in his ANS publication in 1957. Um, since then, we know that there is apparently no evidence that they did not circulate alongside the lightweight Solidi, albeit in much, much, much smaller numbers. Uh, they first appear apparently after or during the reconquest of Italy, suggesting there is some relationship with the Western money systems. And also there are barbaric imitations of the lightweight series too, as there are of the full weight coins. So, what was going on exactly, we don't know. They are also found in hordes in southern Russia, the Ukraine, Bulgaria, and so on. Uh, so whether they were a matter of trade or not, the laws of the empire were specific that the gold coins were not to be removed beyond the boundaries of the empire. So just what they were doing in the hands of the barbarians, who can say? Uh, it has been theorized that they may have been used to make the enormous tribute payments that were given to the Avars during a, a good part of the time period when the lightweight Salidi were being issued. Uh, this still remains to be proven as well. Now, from the writings of Procopius, the famous Roman historian, who's considered to be the last of the classical Roman historians, we have... Uh, a description of the Emperor Justinian, stating that he looked very much like the former Flavian Emperor Domitian. So we can see here Justinian's portrait from one of the great mosaics of San Vitale in Ravenna, uh, and a couple of the busts of Domitian below. It's interesting to speculate just what did the fellow look like. I think all three of these images look like he should be or could be a very different, entirely distinct persons. Uh, but perhaps we can get some idea of what this unusual emperor looked like. Now, his name, Flavius Petrus Sabadius, uh, doesn't give us much indication of his origin. Sabadius actually might refer to some kind of uh, Jewish ancestry. So a curious fact, he apparently was from a, a, a Catholic Christian family from Upper Macedonia. And uh, he came to power through the influence of his probably illiterate or, illiterate or semi-literate uncle, Justin, Justinus I, who became the master of the palace guards and eventually emperor when he succeeded Anastasius in 418, or 518, excuse me. Now, Justinian is well known for his great architectural works. Among these is the Church of San Vitale in Ravenna, where the well-preserved great mosaics relating to his reign can be found. This is the interior of the nave of San Vitale. Uh, Ravenna was the most important Byzantine city of the West, and it actually did serve as a mint from time to time. Uh, here I've included here an example of the typical solidus, which is attributed to Ravenna, probably because of the presence of the star in the field. The style of it is not that much different from those of Constantinople, if at all. But uh, uh, the stars were used for coding, and we find them repeatedly on the issues of the lightweight Solidi as well, as we will see. It was probably around the year 546, time when this uh, piece could have been made in Ravenna, that the lightweight series may well have been introduced. This was a time during the reconquest of Italy. And in the famous image of San Vitale with Justinian, the emperor standing here in the center, we can see him with on his, his immediate right, our left, uh, an image that is thought to be that of the great general Belisarius, who was the patron of the Roman historian Procopius. Uh, to Justinian's immediate left, to our right, is what is believed to be a portrait of his general Narcissus, the eunuch. These two were the ones responsible for the defeat of the Ostrogoths and the eventual Byzantine reconquest of Italy. Now, at the same time, in the church of San Vitale in Ravenna is the great mosaic showing the empress, the powerful empress Theodora, uh, one of the most scandalous ladies to ascend the imperial throne but then one of the most uh, devoutly religious when she came to power alongside her husband. 
she was is well known to have been uh, a very strong advisor of his. In the image shown here, immediately to her left, our right, is a figure that is believed to be uh, her friend Antonina, who was the wife of the General Belisarius. Uh, Theodora probably had something to do with the coinage and perhaps even with the introduction of the lightweight Solibi, uh, because she was a patron of the Comus Sagrarum Largitionum, Petrus, uh, excuse me, Petrus Barsumus, uh, a Syrian banker who became the chief financial officer and one of the leading officials of the Byzantine court. Uh, he was a favorite of hers, and although he was uh, removed from office by Justinian in the 540s, uh, he was reinstated undoubtedly with her influence. Now, she was uh, represented most famously, perhaps, by the great French actress Sarah Bernhardt, shown on her right. Um, Sarah Bernhardt actually went to Ravenna to study the mosaics, went to Constantinople to see the representations that could be identified as Theodora. And here we show uh, an image of her from her role, her great role as Theodora, uh, decked out uh, more or less, or as he, she thought, in the manner of the great empress. The older image of Justinian that I mentioned is actually not in the Constantinople in the Hagia Sophia, which uh, unfortunately recently has been turned back into a mosque rather than a museum. The image of Justinian uh, could well be based upon one of Theodoric, Theodoric the Great, the Ostrogothic king, but it is identified as Justinian in the mosaic with all the, the little gilded tesserae. Now, the major work on the Byzantine lightweight Solidi is that of Howard Adelson uh, and his monograph from 1957 in the ANS's Numismatic Notes and Monograph series. In it, he tried to identify, classify, and list all of the known specimens of that time, uh, time period. Now, since then, quite a few more have been discovered that the lightweight Solidi were recognized and studied as a group at all. If we go back to uh, earlier works, they were virtually unknown. Uh, and even in the time of Adelson's writings, a number of the pieces which we know of today representing various different reigns have not yet been discovered. So the lightweight solidity is still a field uh, developing in Byzantine numismatics. Now you might well suppose that uh, there could be important references in the, the great legal publications of Justi Realis, the, the body of civil law, uh, the famous Codex Justinianus, which included all of the imperial edicts from the Emperor Hadrian onward. Uh, this was codified, issued in 529. Uh, no examples are known from then. The second edition from 534 included all of these laws based basically upon uh, earlier works like the Codex uh, Theodosianus. Uh, second, the Digest, or Pandects, issued in 533, compiled the writings of the greatest Roman jurists. In other words, their legal opinions as they had been collected. These were not originally laws, uh, but then later they were decreed to have the force of law themselves, too. Uh, thirdly, the Institutiones, the Institutes, was prepared as a, a legal textbook for the law schools, uh, sort of a summary of the material within the digests and the codex. And this was used ever onward then throughout the Middle Ages, on into modern times, as a primary tool for students of the law. Now the fourth part is really of greater interest for us, the novellae. Uh, Justinian issued a large number of subsequent laws, uh, nearly all of them in Greek. I think there were three in Latin, uh, several that were bilingual. Uh, these all date after 534, which is when we know the lightweight Solidi must have been introduced. And there is, in fact, one of the novels. Let me see some early publications of the Corpus Juris Civilis and the Novellae. Uh, in fact, in number 159, 
There is even a reference to the changing in the values of the gold. Although it is not explicit, it doesn't give us enough information to know about the, uh, the value of the gold, or what was done with it. Uh, nevertheless, there is at least one indication. And I, I was actually uh, informed or had suggested to me by uh, a knowledgeable dealer friend that maybe there are references that we haven't recognized yet where these unusual coins were referred to under names that were peculiar to the time, which have not yet really been discerned from the rest of the text. Now, since very little is known about anything having to do with Roman denominational nomenclature, it could well be that there are uh, hidden references in our surviving documentation from this period of the Byzantine Empire. Now, under Justinian, uh, the lightweight and the full weight pieces were clearly identified by differing mint or control marks, as we might say. These uh, are typically found in the exerg on the reverse, along with uh, an officina numeral, in the, indicated in the form of a letter from the Greek, Greek alphabet, uh, using the Greek numeral system, uh, This is, which appears at the end of the reverse legend. Those that appear on the ordinary 24 karat or soliquai gold solidi are uh, the name Kon Ob or Constantinopolis Obrusum, the gold of, the, of Constantinople, the capital, and the Officina letters from uh, 1 to 10, which is Alpha to Iota, and also a numeral 12. Uh, I, and beta. Now, the light solidi can be divided into two classes. The first, uh, which probably simply began with a mint mark of the C, O, X, and a star, or perhaps the O, B, or O, B, cross, and a star. These uh, apparently had the weight of 20 of the gold soliquai, or soliquai auri, as they were called. Uh, now, there are really not enough specimens to have a complete idea as to exactly what were the theoretical weights of the various lightweight coins. We know that the full weight Solidi had a theoretical weight of around 4.55. Uh, generally, they cluster closely around 4.5 grams in their weights, whereas the, the lightweight pieces tend to cluster around 4.10 for the pieces of what may be 22 gold soliquai and around 3.78 for the 20 gold soliquai. Now, soliquai uh, was a name that had been used in reference to silver coinage. Here it's used in reference to gold, and it refers more or less to what we would call carats today, but it doesn't refer to the purity of the gold. It refers to the parts into which it was divided. For the so-called 20 gold soliquai, we can see that the double X probably indicated the presence of 20. Uh, some of the other variations are much more equivocal. But we can see here probably the OD double X might just be an error, but who knows. Now, uh, the 20 soliquai, uh, here's a, a typical example of one that has the uh, exergo mint mark OB, and then uh, we get to, uh, indicating that people should take a look at this to realize that it is not a full weight coin without the normal inscription. And here we see the Officina letter I, or IOTA. This would have indicated the 10th workshop of the Constantinople mint. Uh, and interestingly, all of these were made in that mint, that uh, division of the mint, that officina. Uh, there are several variations among the portraits. This is a typical looking one, very much like those we've seen on the several coins earlier on. But there also appear this more broad portrait, which I think looks probably a little bit more like the mosaic image of Justinian in the Santa Polinari Nuovo. Uh, typical, again, we see the, the exergo mint inscription, obrisum, OB, indicating the abbreviation for obrisum, gold in Greek. And then uh, 
the numeral 20, perhaps indicating its, uh, its weight in the soliloquy. Now, Philip Grierson believed that there might have been a group of 21 or 21 and a half soliloquy. Uh, it's difficult to tell what was going on because of the variations in the, the mint marks. Here's an early one that has OB and a star, simply referring to the stars that appear in the field, indicating a difference. Uh, but apparently there's really not enough evidence for us to be sure just what was going on. Again, this is from the same officina, number 10 the iota mark here. Uh, some of the exergo marks are very rare or scarce. Here's a, an example of a CO with a star, again, relating to the star of the field. Again, probably a 20 siliquai, although we can't be absolutely certain. So the variations, there are various different uh, exergo marks those on the 22 or 21 soliquai include several variations. We can see examples here. Uh, these include not only issues with the 10th officina marking of the iota, but also the 9th officina with uh, a theta. Now, the lightweight solidi continued on into the reigns of Justin II, Tiberius Constantine, Maurice Focus, Heraclius, uh, Constans, Constantine the Fourth, and even Justinian the Second. Although uh, the high point of them appears to have come probably under Constans the Second, where they appear to be uh, more common than during the other reigns. The issues of Constantinople include issues of twenty-three gold siliquai and probably of 22. Now, why it was necessary to have examples of coins in 24 siliquai, that's in other words, the typical weight, 24 karat gold solidus, the type of the weight and standard issued for about 700 years consistently. But why these needed to be accompanied by these other pieces, we just do not know. Uh, and the weight variations, 4.35, actually approaches what could have been considered not unusual for a full weight coin if it might have been worn or clipped somewhat. One theory is that these coins were in fact introduced in order to replace worn or clipped coins. Often such pieces are found with graffiti marks on them that might have indicated their value as well. The 22 gold soliquai have a weight cluster of around 4.12 grams and they are found with an officina mark uh, theta stigma. Now, just what this means, we can't be absolutely sure. Uh, and it has been suggested that it may have been a mint mark intended to represent Theopolis or Antioch. However, there is no other discernible difference between the issues that bear this kind of mint mark and the issues from Constantinople. So some authorities in Byzantine coinage classify these pieces under Theopolis or Antioch, and some classify them under Constantinople. Now, there also exist pieces of 20 and 22 gold soliquai from the mint of Ravenna, or at least attributed to Ravenna. And we can see here the uh, exergo marks that can be found on these pieces, and also the variations of the officina markings. Uh, basically, we see an I. Now, whether this really indicates a 10th officina of the Mint of Ravenna is quite doubtful uh, in my estimation. The other marks, including COX cross X, CON X cross X, CON uh, retrograde X cross X, and a dot, uh, Constantinople retrograde uh, with a X cross X, the two dots, CX, NX, U, and so on and so forth. Uh, whether these are really all official imperial issues from the Mint of Ravenna, I think is perhaps still a bit equivocal because we know that the barbarians were actually trying to imitate these coins at the same time as well. So under Justin, we see these variations in the marks. Possibly a 22 soliquai here from the Officina, 
the mid division theta stigma. Now, whether that really means uh, the officina, we just don't know. But uh, there's nothing to signify, particularly that this is an issue that was not from Constantinople. In the 20 Siliqua, you can see here with the mid signature very similar to that of Justinian the first. Now, under Justin and Tiberius, there was a rare joint issue. And I don't have an image of that. I think it's probably only known of one specimen. Uh, but there was a, an example with a, a full weight issue with the Officina Mark Z, Z or seven, which actually shares an obverse die with a lightweight example on which we see the, uh, the mid mark theta sigma in the position of the Officina mark. So just what was going on, it's, it's among the lightweight series, is not extraordinary the way it would be among the ordinary uh, full weight Byzantine gold solidi, which are so common that almost no attempts have been made really to perform dye studies on those for most of the issues. For Tiberius the second Constantine, uh, we have an example here showing a 22 soliquai, the exergo inscription, obrisum for gold, and then we have a cross and a star. I notice there's no cross in the field on these, but the star still was an indication that this was an unusual issue, not of the full weight. Interestingly, the uh, lightweight soliqui, or solidity of 22, 20, or or 23 siliquai are all of a, approximately the same diameter and the, with dyes of a, approximately the same size as the normal weight coins would be. So it was only by the slight weight difference that they would have been quickly identifiable other than by their mid marks. Under Maurice Tiberius, we see issues of the 23 siliquai based upon their apparent weight. And here the mid mark is very much like that of the ordinary full weight coins but a star appears in both the obverse and reverse fields. On the 20 soliquai, uh, we again have the OB with a cross and a star. The star is still indicating something unusual, but the OB and the cross indicating probably that this is the typical underweight coin. Now notice the differences in the portraits here. They're basically the same kind of image but the workmanship varies somewhat in the terms of the presentation. So uh, again, no study has been done on the variations of the portraits. Some are quite a bit larger than others. Uh, sometimes the cheeks are more full. Basically the eyes are set on a slight angle and an eyebrow often uh, as a kind of a unibrow on these things forms a sort of arc across the upper part of the face. From Focus to Constanz II, again, we find the coins divided into the three different weight series of the lightweight coins. The solidi that are apparently of 23 gold soliquai, weighing around 4.35 grams. Light solidi of 22 gold soliquai of around 4.16. And the light solidi of 20 at around 3.78. Now these are our average coins. One of the problems with studying the lightweight series is that earlier students often simply took a mean weight on the coins rather than uh, preparing a, a, very, a, a curb to show the, where the different weights actually fell. So the, the weights that I show here are really not altogether convincing or reliable. For the 23 gold soliquai, you can see some of the variations. The uh, exergal inscription VO Gamma Kappa probably indicates 23. K is the Greek numeral 20, Gamma the Greek numeral 3. So that fits well. But the Kon Ob and Kon Ob with a cross uh, do not fit so well. These are found with the uh, Officina or workshop marks, Alpha to Iota or 1 to, through 10. Uh, and also with uh, the S meaning six uh, as a retrograde letter. The light solidity of 22 gold 
Siliquai, uh, show similar officina marks to those from the earlier rains. And they are known from the officinas Gamma, Eta, uh, Epsilon, Eta, and Iota. The light solidi of 20, again, have uh, very similar inscriptions from those of the earlier rains, clearly marking them as being uh, at 20. And again, with the officinas I, Iota, uh, with a dot and with two dots, what those mean, uh, we can't say really. And also the uh, Epsilon and the Theta. And whether they were made in all of the workshops, we don't know. It's possible that others will turn up eventually, uh, showing that uh, they could have been made in the other officini. We'll take a look at these, the ones that fall into those different weight groups. These are typical examples of the coins of focus from the 23, 22, and 20 Siliqui groups. Here we see the Officina Mark Theta for the ninth workshop of the Mint, presumably. The Officina Mark Iota, indicating the Greek numeral 10 for the 10th workshop of the Mint. Notice the variation in the exergo marks. Uh, the star in the field on the 23 would have been the clue that this was not a normal weight coin. The 22 and the 20 select Y coins uh, didn't need the star because they have a much more clear, or unclear, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, exergo marking showing the variation in the, the weight standard. So it's curious that we have between the 23, just a little bit off, and the 20, which is clearly marked, this one with the obesum and a cross and a star for the 22 or perhaps 21 or even 21 and a half gold siliqui has been suggested by some in this notice. For Heraclius, we have a similar situation. Again, the con ob exergo mark, but with a star to indicate the coin of unusual weight. And for the 22 siliqui, organized into an issue this particular, these, all three of these uh, show the mint mark epsilon, indicating the fifth workshop of the mint, which apparently may have been devoted at least for a time to these lightweight solidi. The top and the bottom piece relate to the same time period of issue, whereas the, the 22 silica piece does not. Under Constance, when these pieces the lightweight coins become somewhat more common. We see a 23 siliqua issue here with the mint mark theta. Uh, here we have cross after the mint signature in the exerg, but also a large star in the field as an indicator of the variant weight. And once again, we have the 20 siliqua piece. They got the letters backward here, the B and the O instead of OB, and which is perhaps not uh, unintentional. For Constantine the fourth through Justinian the second, the pieces become much scarcer. Again, though, we find lightweight solidi of 23 gold siliqui with the various different officina markings from alpha through iota or none. Again, these would have been indicated with a star. And lightweight solidi of 20 gold siliqui uh, typically with the same exergo mark VO, uh, Wiginti, or 20, and with the officinas, again, alpha through iota with a couple of omissions. Uh, in addition to those, probably all from Constantinople, there is uh, a rare, very rare issue from Syracuse of 22 siliqui probably made upon the occasion when the emperor actually moved to Sicily. And in this one, a peculiarity is that uh, it's less clear that it was a piece of a substandard weight. It looks like there may have been a cross or a star following the exergal mint mark. It's not, not so clear. Justinian II, we see examples here of his coins, pieces from the uh, Officina Alpha and Officina Iota a very large extended B in the mint signature of, for Constantinopolis. Just what was going on, hard to say. 
the bibliography, a very incomplete one on just the most well-known of the works that I've been consulting, indicates uh, that uh, there has been study on these things, but not nearly as much as what there might be. Various theories have been proposed trying to relate these coins to outbreaks, for instance, of the bubonic plague, which uh, we feel wreaked havoc, to some extent at least, during this period of the Byzantine Empire, beginning with the plague of Justinian, which first appeared about the year 541, uh, became a, probably a near pandemic by the next year or two, until about 545, but then there were outbreaks of the plague for another 200 years after this time. And it's been suggested that perhaps the lightweight Solidi were an early mazenary uh, issue intended to offset some of the problems caused by the plague. However, most recent research has indicated that the plague of Justinian, uh, 541 to 544 or so, probably was not nearly as devastating as some of the contemporaries like Procopius would have us believe. There is in fact no evidence of uh, depopulation, no evidence of a lack of uh, farming activity based on pollen studies. Uh, coinage continued to be issued very abundantly throughout this period. Uh, so it's probably uh, nothing that equates with the great uh, bubonic plague epidemic yeah, that occurred in Europe in the late 1340s. So interesting as this may be, uh, I invite questions and answers from all of you. I'd like to thank you for coming to our talk today. I'm gonna unmute everybody if anybody has anything to ask. Uh, Bob, it's uh, very interesting to me that um, when we next find lightweight solidy appearing under the emperor Nicephorus Phocas, uh, who reigned from 963 to 966 or thereabouts, uh, the coins were um, visually the same as the full weight solidy. Um, and Nicephorus was accused of falsifying the currency because of this. And uh, those coins are, are known as, uh, in the singular, tartaron and in plural, tartara. Um, but these, these coins are clearly marked to show the user that they weigh less than the, than the standard coin. So obviously any theory that attempts to justify their existence has to take that into account. You know, I have nothing to offer other than what you have talked about, but it is perplexing. But I've often wondered too, um, the barbarian kingdoms that you referred to a little bit um, in, in that they imitated the gold coins, had a weight standard based on the barley corn, whereas the Romans based their weight standard on the carob seed, which in Greek is called a karation. Our word carrot comes from that. And in later times, about 100 years after the period we're talking about, um, in Gaul, the Merovingians started to mint solidy and tremissus based on a, um, a barley corn standard, and they were lighter than the uh, standard Byzantine coins and their solidity, particularly from the mint of Marseille are clearly marked to indicate that they weigh less than the, than the standard Roman gold coin, which was minted 72 to the Roman pound um, uh, uh, in their full weight. And I think that's also interesting, but um, I've ne never seen that suggested that they were trying to match some external weight system. Uh, actually, a number of scholars have suggested that, that uh, they were intended for trade and were intended to be something that might be more familiar to some of their barbarian trading partners. But what speaks against that is the actual law against exporting gold among the Byzantines. So, I mean, it happens there. Supposedly, some of the lightweight Salidi have been found in the western parts of the empire and among the barbarians. 
But just how this happened, we don't know. At the same time, uh, they are found in the Balkans to a, a fairly extent, great extent. So it's hard to explain either way. But yes, they, they may well have had a relationship with the, the Western at the time of the, the reconquest of Italy or during that period. But then why they continued for another 150 years, hard to say. Well, is there any hoard evidence that light and full weight solid dye circulated together or do they never occur in the same voids? Uh, I have read that they do occur together. They have been found in the same lords. The, the lightweight pieces are simply far, far less common. Um, um, Medlick in his work with Han suggested that they might be found in a proportion of one to 10, at least during the early period. Uh, in my own curse from Zara, I find we have maybe a proportion of one lightweight to 40 or 50 of the ordinary. So what was going on, we just don't know. There, there are not hordes of, of exclusively lightweight pieces as far as I know. Anyone else? Uh, there's, there's a 19th century parallel to this in uh, Britain where the uh, gold sovereign worth 20 shillings circulated alongside the gold guinea worth 21 shillings. And that was, there was a social difference because the gold guinea had a built-in uh, premium or tip of 5%. And it was used for things like paying attorneys and doctors with that exactly. built-in tip. The, the lightweight solidine may have simply had a built-in discount of one or two or four twenty-fourths. Um, very logical. Uh, and again, like the guinea, the guinea at that point that you mentioned in the 19th century was valued at 21 shillings, but it had been valued at various other rates uh, at, during its lifetime from the late 1600s onward, sometimes a number of additional shillings. We also have an American parallel in the 19th century because the quarter eagle valued at $2.50 circulated alongside $3 gold pieces. Yes. yes. And there was a very slight difference there. It's an interesting parallel. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bob. There's also some nice little thank yous and comments in the chat if you want to check out before we close out the whole conversation. but. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, we don't have any more questions, and I'm going to uh, just let you guys know that our next Money Talks is going to be on October 3rd with Warren Esty. He's going to be talking on dye studies and um, what we can learn from that. And the next, you know, the next long table is going to be this Friday with Lucia on her favorite vault, her vault favorites, which is mostly all Roman stuff. So if you're into that, come join us. See you guys later. Everyone else on mute still or something. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you everyone. So, Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thanks, Bob.